just to take you through that sanding process, what I'm going to be concentrating on is not the face and the back face, it's all these edges, so the rebates, the inside edge, all the moulding, and the same on the other side when they're double-sided. So nothing that is seen when it's painted and finished will remain unsanded, even the rebates, because that always looks bad. You see like seven or eight mil of that rebate. If you see the paint, like the ripples from the rebates where it's cut it through the paint finish, it looks terrible. So you've got to sand all that out, time consuming. Using 150 grit paper and that should be enough then to paint straight on top of. That's all that edge done. The light, light sand off that rebate. Both edges are done. Just going to come in from this side with a bit of a uh, soft pad, foam pad, a little bit of contour to that piece. Try and take the moulding marks out. Go yeah, get a coat of primer on it, do that for all the pieces. That's going to give me that uh, really strong product from the timber all the way to the top surface finish. So it's a one sort of one product system. Hey, don't follow Anchor Style on Instagram. Get on. So yeah, it looks horrific at this stage, but all we're doing, all of that for, because that's fairly easy to sand even when it's been glued together. Just in these locations here, when you've got a piece of wood here, it's really difficult to sand in all these corners and stuff. So we're doing all that just to get a nice finish in them positions, really. We've got it up to the stage of putting a first coat of paint on these inside edges. I'll just brush that on to save doing loads of masking and setting up the paint pump, which I would have then had to clean out because it was going to be frosty that night. So um, it's quicker just to brush this first coat on. Then I'm going over it with uh, sanders and sandpaper. And I've basically got to sand it through. So you can see there that I've took right back through to the wood there, but it's left a bit of paint on in this bit here. And that would have been a ripple in the finish. So uh, I'm basically going to go through a process of building up paint, sanding it back, building it up, sand it back until I can get a matte finish sort of sanded effect. So like the bit right there in the middle where there's no sort of glossy bits and no timber showing through, but I keep painting and sanding back until I get every spot of these edges into that position. So it's a fairly long process. I've got the uh, LS130 with that profile pad. This is a linear sander, so it just goes back and forward. So you can have a profile pad and sit it in the mold and I'll show you that in a minute. And everything I'm sanding with is uh, 320 grit paper so that you get a really nice smooth uh, finished sand with it. You don't see the grain of the sanding through into your next coat of paint. So you go just sand in there, you can see them couple of imperfections. It's probably from the belt sander where I've just caught it a little bit and it's dipped in and uh, sanded a little bit deeper on them two ripples there. 
than anywhere else. And that would have shown up in that sort of finished sheen when it caught the light. So that's what this sanding is all about, just to figure out where them bits are and work them down. Smooth everything out nicely. And the first coat I like to take back because it shows these things up really well. Take that back in, take it out in the first coat, then you can start building up your paint thickness to get that nice finish off of the paint. It just so happens that a pure coincidence, this pad I've got for the, the sander here is exactly the right shape for this moulding, so never happens really, that's unusual. I'll take it. Again, we can see all them imperfections coming up to the surface, so them ripples in that moulding from the cutter showing up through the paint. So at this stage, you can either sun that back with a coarser grip paper, or we can uh, build it up with a bit of paint and let the paint fill the sort of humps and hollers, which is what I'm gonna do. This bit here is a good example. I probably shouldn't have put that into paint. Um, I've not sanded it enough, but you can see that will always show through into the finished coat of paint. So I've got to go back to like a 120 grit and just sand this wood until I get rid of all the green. And then I've got through and I've got a smooth surface to start painting from again. Really hard to see without that guide coat of paint in place. The client called in to see the other day and we just pushed it together so they could have a quick look around and uh, looks quite good in the shabby chic, half painted, half sanded effect. So I'm going to take it all to bits, get another couple of coats on all these inside edges. I used a spray gun this time, uh, so I'll have to do a bit of masking, but I can get two coats on really quickly and that should be it then. We can glue it together. So I'm just going to tape these up, get, get a little bit on that uh, mitre just to protect it. Come across that join. So I just want to sort of blow the paint on these edges. I can spray at an angle like this so it doesn't go in that joint so I can paint on that direction so it's not too critical to tape everything I just want to stop the, the paint going on all the tenons and stuff because it's not as good for the glue up Right, so I'm going to use the pump to spray these coats of paint. So a quick method of what I, how I use my pump. So I leave it in water, uh, sometimes not even washed out, sometimes leave the paint um, just one washing out to get the majority of the paint back out of the system. So I just cycle the pump through back into the water that it's sat in and then see, wait for it to run clear. If it's not running clear, you're going to have to change the water and cycle it again until it's running through clear. So you know that this hose is pretty clean then just drop that into your paint. Then take the cap off your gun. Now I'm just adding in a bit of pump pressure, no air assist, just pump pressure. So it starts cycling the gun and we can just trigger that into a waste can. Just down the side of the can so that you're not getting any splash back from the bottom of the bucket basically. If there's fluid in the system, it helps to draw the paint through the pickup pipe. If you completely drain the system of water when you're washing it through, it's really difficult to pick up the paint, especially with really thick exterior paint. So see it's caught now, it's pulled the paint all the way up that tube because there was fluid in here to bring it through the system. I'll just gun it into the waste can 
until we get thick green paint coming out in the waste bucket. Once we're getting that just back into the tin, then I'll cycle it for about a minute. Put about 20 pumps through it so that you sort of mix in the paint around so you get an even mix of paint. Uh, cap back on and I'm ready to spray. Settings for spraying. Um, this is real world, this is. This isn't your showroom uh, bit of kit, but this is a this is a grafter, it's done years. Um, I tend to keep the pump pressure quite low, so it's sort of coming through the tip and atomising, but you're getting heavy tails. And then I put plenty of air assist pressure on, so if you trigger it and look at your pressures, once when it's triggered, I tend to run about 30 psi, which is, what's it showing there, 42? ish when it's not triggered so that's where i sit with my gun pressures you should get a fairly nice little spray pattern like that which works well for me the valuable bit of kit in the spray booth is some cling film pop a bit of cling film on top of your painting just stops the airflow over the top of it even if it's badly put on like that There we go, painted, first coat, um, double sided bits, I've painted both sides of the small ones but these bigger ones I'll have to do the side in a couple of hours when it's sort of tacked dry. But the, yeah, no brainer with the spraying, you get so much more paint on the material, you have to do less coats and it's quicker to apply, just a bit of a pain, you have to mask bits off but yeah I think uh, one more coat and a D-nib and that'll be pretty much my finish on the frame so it's really nice right so to keep the workflow efficient i can work on some other components of the frame while then bits of paint are drying so i'm going to be working on these panels getting them made and we can get some timber out for all of these staff beadings and the little glazing bars that are going to cap this bit off they're going to stick onto the glass to look like a proper glazing bar but it's, it is actually going to be two units so it's very unusual this one so I've got to get beadings out for all of these panels, make the panels out a couple of sheets of plywood if I've got it, if not I've got some tricoil I can use and also make these sort of infill bits as well, a little raised panel that matches the detail up here in the roof. So you've not seen that yet, that's not fitted and I've not released any video on it but uh, there's some panels to go in the roof there that I've made with a little bevel round that sort of mirrors the columns of the door and these panels sort of mirror this section down here these panels how they're laid out it's kind of echoed up here so it's quite subtle that's how it's going to look so we'll get that done i'm going to cut these down slightly bigger than i need them there's two panels for the frame and then one for the door that i can make at the exact same time so I may as well get that done Right, so I'm going to make these panels up with some insulation. So I'm going to thin the insulation down on the bandsaw, then sand it through the wide belt to get it to an even thickness.
Right, so the sandwich panel is effectively going to be uh, Celotex uh, Tricoya. Oh, Tricoya, Celotex, Tricoya in that configuration. I'm going to glue it together. But I need a 50mm finish panel, and obviously that is 50mm Celotex. So I've got to rip it down. So I'm going to go on the bandsaw. Them panels over there are wider than my bandsaw will cut, so I've just split it into two pieces that will pass through the bandsaw. Get it within like a mil, and then just calibrate them on the wide belt and glue it all together. This is my jig for ripping down tall stuff, so it's just a nice degree bit of plywood that I can clamp to the bed, and it uh, allows me to have a really tall fence. I've ripped a lot of expensive nails down on this one. Right, so before anyone comments about this being MDF, that these panels are being made on, it's an exterior door. This is Medite Tricoya Extreme. If you've not come across it, then give it a Google. Really, really interesting material. Must have had about a thousand comments on the channel from the exterior door video, where I did a repair on the exterior door using some of this stuff. Um, about people, all they could see was that I was using MDF outside, but this is the material that I used, and it's the best product you could use outside, hands down. Okay, so let's get this glued up. I've had a zero profit day today because I've had a machine playing up a bit, so I'm trying to figure out the faulty wiring on that. I probably should have filmed it to pay for it, but uh, I missed that opportunity. I'm going to put a bit of PU glue down on these. It doesn't need to really stick down that well. It's going to be sandwiched in with beads and sealant. And, uh, yeah. Rip that out of it. Give it the best opportunity. I'll put a bead around the outside edges as well. To make sure they're absolutely got a bit of glue on. Well, flat packers are quite good for spreading glue, so if you hold them flat enough, they've got like a, a toothed edge on them, so it leaves like a half a mil tooth detail in you in whatever you're spreading out. A bit quick here because I've got loads to glue on. Damn, I do. Let's get glue on that edge. Whoops. I'm just going to stack all these and then put some weight on it. I've got a lot of glue residue on the face. they will be sticking together. Whoops. Worst bit about old doors was the condensation on the solid panels. It's uh, completely avoided with this, so shame you can't buy it. I think you can buy this in a pre-made panel. I remember seeing it when I was really into my joinery. I've uh, kind of moved to more into interior work the last few years, but I can remember someone, someone was producing and a coil panel with an insulated core, like as a pre-made item that you could just buy. And uh, quite a good product, I guess, if you are doing a lot of this type of stuff. Yeah. Not too bothered about how well it clamps down, as long as they're pretty even. Shove them through the wide belt to calibrate them. A bit of inch board in here. Then a... Brace. Just, uh, 
give that a gentle clamp, I don't want to ruin the bench. The carpet underneath should put a nice little bit of even pressure across that bottom board. Keep it all nice and flat. Right, I think we're getting rid of that, so it's pretty much dry. This video is probably going to be the worst video on this series because it's all over the place. I've been uh, jumping about fixing machines, so apologies if it's not stitched together incredibly well. But you've not paid for it, so you can't be too disappointed. You've ever heard the term SIPS panel, structural insulated panel? Then this is sort of what they are. It's a timber outer with an insulated core. Very, very strong. You've got them two plies in like a torsion box construction, but very, very lightweight and thermally efficient. So great, great things. And they've not stuck together, but brilliant. Since I've got the paint set up, I've pushed these through a bit. If I can spray them at the same time, it'd be nice and easy. So I'll just get a couple of coats on the face, clean a bit back, and I'll cut them off to size just before I uh, screw them in or glue them into the rebates they're going to sit within. If you're wondering how well that is stuck together, if I just pull on that. Fairly well. It's as good as like the foil would be stuck to the insulation itself. 